Welcome to the Weekly Trend, a podcast for navigating the markets through the lens of technical analysis. The Weekly Trend podcast is provided for educational purposes only and does not constitute any professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the information or content without first seeking advice from a registered financial planner. Welcome back to the Weekly Trend podcast. Today is Friday, July 15th, 2022. S&P 500 currently sitting at 3854. I'm David Zarling. I'm here with the man who battles in the trenches with me each and every week, Ian McMillan. Some information from the market this week, but this is going to be one of our quickest podcasts we've ever done just because we have a lot of things we've been working on internally here. Uh, some days, someday you guys will be able to hear about it. Soon, soon. Someday, but that's taken some of our time. And our main priority is managing risk for our clients. So this is going to be really quick. Forgive us. Or maybe this is going to be the best 20 minutes you've heard all week. I have no idea. I think it will be. Where do you want to start? Uh, Well, first and foremost, right, we've got a market that, again, went a lot of places, yet nowhere this week. A lot of volatility. You know, we're... Similar price as the gap that goes back to the beginning of June and something like the S&P 500. We haven't reclaimed any important levels, which we've defined on here in the past. I think the first step in that would be you know, reclaiming something like 39.10 on the S&P 500. Haven't done that yet. At the same time, relationships matter. Relationships, yeah. There's been a lot of change. Like There's been some under the surface, a lot of Relative relationships, both good and bad, have perked up on the radar this week. Yeah, let's talk about some of those. Do you have Do you have a couple that you have in mind that you want to touch base on? Um, well, I know one that you in particular are quite fond of is semiconductors. Yeah, I think that false breakdown. Okay, so comparing the semiconductors versus the S and P five hundred using something like SMH versus SPY. There was a horizontal level broken just recently, end of June, which had kind of indicated that sellers had control. Yeah. And semiconductors being one of those leading areas that we like to see do well. And that quickly reversed this week. We now have what's called a false breakdown on our hands from false moves come fast moves. But now we got to see price confirm. It's ha- that false breakdown has been confirmed, but now price must continue to follow through for that yeah. to be the case. And that would be one piece of evidence for some type of near-term bottom. Again, it's always dangerous to get in the bottom calling business. That's not really what I'm doing. It's just- And we were accused of that last week by someone who didn't listen to the podcast. Correct. (laughs) Yeah, someone relatively well-known accused us of calling a bottom. We Um, definitely were not. Um, No. and But what the irony being that maybe this week we're calling for a like as you like to say, not necessarily the bottom, but a bottom is some of the evidence we're seeing this week. I do. I think there's again more evidence than we had in than last week. Than in the on the March rally or the May rally. You know, I think they I think we could see the biggest bounce that we've seen. I think the March rally is like 11. If we go intraday lows, intraday highs. Yeah, uh, no, and, about 12%. And the semiconductors being one of those things that if if we're going to see them on a relative basis outperform, mm-hmm. that tends to be on, on a, a risk on type behavior. You know, oh, you, you had look, the, right? Remember the Micron earnings? Yep. And those, right? They got crushed and they are now, I mean, oh, I yeah. know, we talked yeah. about this. It was the, it's the exact opposite thing that happened in March. Micron had amazing earnings in March and it gapped up 6% only to finish that session red. After that session, it went into a 33% drawdown, continued to draw. It had already been in a drawdown, but an an extra 33% to that. So then last week, right, we have Micron with horrible earnings. It gaps down. And it gets spot right back up. Yeah. And, and that's now information. we are 20% off that, you know, the lows of that day. And do we, do we know whether the, 
how do I put this? Because we're fond of saying it's not the earnings, it's the reaction to the earnings. Were the earnings quote unquote bad for Micron? You know, I believe that they were, again, you know, us, Dave and I as pure technicians, please don't quote us on what happened on an earnings call three weeks ago. Um, well, and, and the reason why I bring it up earnings is just, report. yeah, correct. I think they were bad. They were bad. That just like in March, they were good. Right. Stock got slammed. This time they were bad. Got, you know, and then stuck its bought up. Isn't that interesting from a psychological perspective? that it's really about the price reaction because the market's looking six to 12 months in the future. And so did we just see bad earnings out of Micron, but that's the worst of the earnings for a little while? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But Ian's point and my point would be when you have price have a positive reaction higher for bad earnings, and vice versa. That is information you have to pay attention to. And this is happening in this environment where semiconductors all of a sudden have reclaimed an important level on a relative basis. I would also throw financials in there. Yeah. As being on the ropes, like as as they save themselves. Right. As of yesterday, uh, yeah. it look we it looked like financials as a whole were going to break another leg lower. And they've also created. Technicians would call it an abandoned baby on something like XLF Mm -hmm. with a false breakdown in play. That's information. Um, And that's how you manage risk. If you're short something like that, that's where you exit. You know within a day that you're on the wrong side of the trade. And from moves like that, you can see price move higher much quickly. But we also need to paint the picture that let's say XLF rallies financials xlf rallies up to 35 bucks pretty logical level for sure huge level it would feel great right because that's about 10 percent, 11 percent higher from here right so that would mean oh man this feels great like it's a relief but it doesn't mean things are from a big picture perspective from months to years perspective fixed it would just no. mean from a days to weeks perspective there's some relief yeah, I mean, we've still got downward sloping 200-day moving averages on a majority of stocks and assets out there. For sure, your shorter terms, your 100, one, I mean, momentum is down. And this is, you know, is this just your typical, this conversation you and I have a lot, is this your typical bear market behavior where we've talked about this, where levels, I mean, managing a bear market is not as simple as just do the opposite of what you would do in a bull market. Um, things behave much differently. Mm-hmm. And is this, yes, it's a failed breakdown. Is it just another bullish fantasy? Well, you know, and you know, it's, it's a green shoot that then gets. Right. It's a near term. I think there's multiple theses. Uh, one, one thesis could be we've established an important bottom. That's one thesis. Yeah. The only way we confirm that as being more likely is above 4165 on the S&P 500. Now, for the time being, the thesis that it's that or something bigger, I'm sorry, it's something less. So first things first, you'd have to clear 3907 or 3900 before we would say this is anything more than just a short-term bottom. But above 3907, you have in mm-hmm. between theses in play. Long term, yes, possible that it's a bigger bottom. But really, I mean, we're the SP is what is this? 11%, almost 12% below its 200 day moving average. That was actually, I was just looking that at myself. Yeah. So, like, and we know that that minus 12% area that 12% deviation away from the 200-day moving average in something like the S&P 500, don't use that against everything, but for the S&P 500, that tends to be a stretched uh, limit. And you could, you could rebound back to the, uh, to the 200-day moving average and really not fix anything and somewhere between 10 and 13% S&P and then roll back over. Yeah, you know, or even if you grind up to these late May highs, like 41, 
60. I mean, if you want yeah. to grind up there and let that, yeah. let the 200 day catch down. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because it's been a big move. This has been a big, we have had a 20, I mean, whatever. I don't know what the intraday 22% or 20, I guess the intraday lows from intraday highs was 24%. That's a big move. Is there, does that leave open a pretty possible scenario that you move sideways in really silly fashion? Big up days, big down days, just really nothing catches traction. Do you move sideways, let these moving averages catch down? Yeah. I think that's absolutely got to be considered. And counter trend moves are perfectly normal. You know, I think of, and again, I want to be careful because I'm going to use some years here that everybody gets all hot and bothered about 2008. You know, you had this break of the S&P 500 below 1375 back in 2008. That was an important break, but you subsequently had a a bottom, not the bottom in March of 08 that rallied 12% up to the 200 day moving average. Yeah. And then, and then subsequently got crushed. I'm not calling for that as a prediction. I'm just saying that as a thesis, right back up to that broken neckline, huh? Yeah. Right back up to prior resistance, 200 day moving average, and then subsequently fell off. Yeah. Right. Until we reclaim some of these levels, this 4165, the 200 day moving average, and that flattens out and moves higher, we're still in an environment where, yes, we can rally 10, 10 to 12 percent. That doesn't mean that this thing is fixed. Now, admittedly, there's some things taking place that are positive, such as financials finding some footing potentially, right? Because how bullish are we really if, if financials are breaking down? Yeah. And, and same thing with semiconductors. If the semiconductors are bad on a relative basis, how bullish can we really be? But now that we've reclaimed important levels on a relative basis for semiconductors versus S and P. Okay. you got my attention. Maybe we need to be a little more optimistic in the near term. I think there's been enough damage done long term. All right. So I, I, I see you, I hear your risk on kind of eyebrow raising happenings in the market mm-hmm. i'm gonna oh man uh, throw them back at you okay one, okay. That lo- one that we've lost okay which is china yeah yeah i mean biotech's still hanging in there that was an early leader biotech is still you know trying to consolidate here and hold a lot some of these levels but china yeah I mean, that, and for i mean foreign stocks had a horrible week uh yes. foreign Emerging markets, Latin America. And where would emerging markets be without China right now? Yeah. yeah. No, your, your point is extremely valid. And, and, and the beauty of being adaptive is if we're going to express any exposure on any counter trend thesis, it's not coming from emerging markets. You know what I mean? Like that, that, that's what allows us to adapt is we don't have to buy international. No. It's I beautiful. I mean, I don't know if since I've worked, since we've worked together, if we've ever been overweight for an equity. Like, no, I know we've owned spots. No, if anything, we've been short. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, right, right. Brazil There's been spots. And things right. Like, yeah, yeah, we've taken spots, uh, long or short in certain areas. Some, yeah, it's definitely been more play the short side on any type of massive rally. Right. Um, and there, that day will come, though. Like, I, well, I'm, you know, when we think about international, we have to think about the dollar, which, you know, touched. Mm. I when is that thing going to stop? When is that going to stop? Yeah, maybe it cools off. Yeah, one, it touched 109 this week, yeah, which, is kind, this week which is kind of the yesterday. almost the halfway point out of this range that goes back to 2015. If we're measuring, we've talked about the 120 level on something like DXY, the trade weighted dollar. And that's to me, like, if you think about, that a lot of times price levels seem very obvious. It's just a matter of how price gets there. Yeah. And, and, and once you do get there, couldn't you see a scenario where the dollar goes to 120? And that's about where you see international equities bottom. Well, I mean, I, I, it goes back to, and, and we've mentioned this a couple of times, I think, that, and this is a great example. So late last year, dollar sitting at nine. Ish, and mm-hmm. we said huge possibility that this goes to 104. 
did we know? I mean, and that's based on, okay, where we're going to create a range. Do you know now that it breaks out of that range? No one knows that at the time, but here we are. Yeah, exactly. And as long it, as you're above 104 now, that's I mean, the thesis. That's yeah, the thesis. right. The next stop is 120. How does it get there? Um, I mentioned this earlier. Like, I don't, I don't think it would move at the same. I hate to use this word parabolic extreme, but the dollar's been, I mean, this is a big move for the dollar. And you look across the world, like so Oof. many currencies just yeah. getting destroyed. You know, I, th- I think the All Star Charts team shared something ish- inter- interesting this week, and that's gold and dollars, definitely a big breakdown and a little bit problematic for that asset class or that particular asset. But the dollar and lots of other currencies, not so bad, which, which shows us that inflation elsewhere is even so worse, even worse than. Here, I mean, which yeah, I, we sit here and cringe at these nine, you know, eight and a half, nine, or whatever, nine point one was a. It is. I mean, think, think the Lord we don't live in a lot of these other locations that are right. Yeah, and and I know that was the topic du jour this week. I'm sure that there was an inflation in opinions about inflation, and I really don't want us necessarily to go down that route because eventually. These things move in cycles, and then there's deflation yeah. that follows in- inflation. Now, kind of related to that gold asset class scenario, what are we seeing out of like commodities as a whole? Still, still rough. I know we talk a lot about you know grains. Grains are obviously a popular topic on the podcast, but you look at things like lumber. Mm. Lumber is, gosh. I mean, we had a we had a sixty percent drawdown, and we bounced here. You know, you know, in June we had a nice bounce, but lumber down another like seventeen percent this week. Yeah, I mean, lumber's copper. Lumber's got some beta. Yeah, copper. Copper had another bad. I mean, it's yeah, it's green today, but I mean, you look at that weekly chart, and it's just red, 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 and especially after the candle, right? Because it finished well off the lows last week. So to see those get taken out, I mean, people want, right, the same aluminum and aluminum, horrible chart. Yeah. So industrial metals and still still hurting. I mean, this copper level that's between three bucks and 325, hugely important. It'll be interesting to see if buyers show up there, but you see things like that and you trade it off versus... Yes, financials uh, had a false breakdown. Yes, semiconductors reclaiming important levels on a relative basis. But you have all these other things that let you know that we're definitely not out of the woods by any means. And we're still in this relief bounce type scenario. How about gold? I mean, gold itself going out. uh, We will get two-year weekly closing lows today. Wow. That's not an uptrend. No, I mean, gold is March 2020, exact yeah. same spot we were at at the COVID bottom. Well, you know, you look at like transports. What do you think about industrials? You know, with deer. Well, you had mentioned earlier this week that I the just... deer and caterpillar didn't bounce at all. Yeah, bear didn't, you know, and so you have weak industrials. <sighs> So it's a, it's definitely a mixed bag, and and some of these relationships. And I know you did a good job pointing out uh, growth versus value, because that right that that does matter too. Yeah, like, which way you're tilted, and you know we've ridden the growth train. We had great success riding the value train early in the year. Where are we in that, that in that relationship? I, growth versus value. Hi, we bought in here. Does growth take back over? I mean, it's been leading the last six weeks i see it as a counter trend move right i think that value on a relative basis outperforms growth and would stick with the same until it changes it's going to be yeah value is going to outperform to the downside that would be my thesis yeah right and that that's just one of many and Mm -hmm. and all you'd be doing is look at the, the relative chart to see uh, whether that's the case, you know, using a relationship like SPY V versus SPY G, maybe that relationship does see growth outperform and we're back in some type of range in the relationship. That's another thesis. 
And really, you just use price to manage which thesis is in favor. Yeah, I know. Wrong. One, we'll know. We'll I think know real one, quickly. Yeah, I think one of the real linchpin charts or real linchpin relationships that we look at internally is Apple versus the S&P. Gosh. And we, how many times have we talked on here about it's these big play, the, the all-stars of the market, the Microsoft and the Apple, those would have to weaken. For this to get significantly worse, those would have to weaken. On, on a rapid basis. On a, correct. Correct. On a, they've already been weak, but they'd have yeah. to be weaker than the market as its whole and pull down the market with it. Apple did earlier this week record a new relative high. However, intriguing. Yeah. It, you know, they they're holding up. And, and we'll see after we'll see the next after week today. or so. Yeah. After the day, after the week or so, where that ends up. Because really, if Apple's going to outperform to the upside, or I'm sorry, I'll perform on a relative basis. Same with my Microsoft. Um, and Microsoft's not in the same position as Apple, but Apple being the largest player on the planet, that has ramifications. And until or is we- it is it that Apple is now viewed as this like? So I go back and forth on this. Is Apple now like seen as a consumer staple? Mm, that phones are a utility. Or just like Apple as viewed as this, like it's like, it's too like G- big to fail behemoth. And like no matter, Ford. no ma- if there's 14% unemployment, everyone's still going to go to the Apple store and buy their iPhone. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a higher tech. Like you're going like to buy your, your milk, your bread, and your iPhone. Yeah. Is that the way it is viewed now? I don't. I mean, do people, would you, if we're going, if we're, if you're a PM and, and you're like, we're going into a uh, extended bear market or do I like, and, but I got to be long. I don't know. I feel like Apple might be in my portfolio. Oh, and the other, another argument, if we're doing fundamental hats is who's got the largest cash balance Yeah, in a, in a strong dollar environment. And it's strong. Yeah. So I. But it still goes back to each bull market has its leaders. And it's not until those leaders lead to the downside that you have anything of significance. Now, I don't want to sit here and play like minus 20% S&P 500 isn't significant. It is. And it was. But the really big ones, the really bear markets, it's when the leaders become the laggards. And for example, 08, that's really financials were the leaders, international Mm -hmm. were the leaders in that bull market. And they were the ones that led to the downside. Yes. Dot com. Um, great. Dot com was all the, you know, your oracles and the high tech growth yeah. names that led way up and then they led on the way down. And so until we see Apple and Microsoft and some of these bigger names pull the market down, there's still some that would go back into the bucket of maybe this is a bottom. And we continue to move higher from here because those two didn't give up, didn't give up the ghost just yet. We'll see. I'm ready. Uh, for them too. Yeah, I mean, that's perfectly. Or, fine. Are they down? I mean, are they down? And like this is there's abs there is absolutely right. The evidence doesn't say that yet. We could be looking back in 12 months, S and P sitting at 5,500, and this was this was it. Like, this was it, and that's fine. That's and, fine. I can accept that. And the only way it can be it is if it's closing above, above 3907, yeah. 3915 area, and then 4165. And that's yeah. the math. That's the math of price. It has to clear certain levels before it gets to the you next get above 4165. And then like, yeah, let's, let's talk about next like new bull market. Yeah. Let's talk about how aggressively long we are like that. If we're in that environment, we're back above 4165. Like that's probably a a really great environment to be getting. And then if you're back below, you're out. Yep. It's all about that binary approach. We talked equities, a little bit about commodities, bonds. Trying. I feel like TLT's trying. Right. Rates put in the bottom here. You know, the TNX, TYX definitely whipsawing around previous Mm -hmm. highs. TLT around previous lows, AGG, kind of the same boat, broke important levels back in uh, April. 
still below those lows. We'll see, you know, your higher risk, your junk bonds. Yeah, those are junk single. trying to b- bottom near those. And really, you look at something like like right. junk, and it's trying to follow through on its really it's nice. Trying. But those, I mean, the momentum down is so, and we've had, I mean, we had this in late May, you know, junk put in a great couple of weeks, rally 5%. I know you sit there and say, that doesn't sound big. It's it's big for junk bonds, 5% move in a week and a half. It's pretty big. And then, you know, it fizzles out. Yeah. And still not out of the woods. One final piece uh, before we, we, we sign off crypto. You know, if we just talk big boys like Bitcoin and Ethereum, trying to hold on, right? They're in these ranges that let's use Ethereum, pretty well defined. Let's call it above a thousand, below twelve fifty consolidation. Now, mm-hmm. that's a pretty significant range, but until that range gives us a direction, there's nothing really to talk about there. I mean, you. You could see a bottom here in Ethereum and Bitcoin at pretty logical levels. You could see it. Yeah, you could see it. Um, typically, you see longer bases for any type of sustainable bottom. And again, you could come out of this near-term base above 1250 and Ethereum rally all the way up into 1900, not fix anything and roll back over. And that's, I guess that's where I'd like to paint the picture of where we're at is just in the days to weeks time frame. There's some definite positives that we could see a relief, a relief rally that maybe turns into something more, but it's still happening in a context of these weeks to months downtrends. And that's how counter trends move. It doesn't make them easy. It's not mm-hmm. like counter trends are easy to deal with. Or, yeah. And you know, you look at Bitcoin, are we just building a pennant here? You know, we're still above those 20, late 2017. I always get conf- Did it peak in December 2017 or January 2018? I think it was like right before Christmas 2017, right? Are you talking about Bitcoin? Bitcoin. Yeah, peaked uh, December 2017. It was one of their peaks. Yeah, so we're sitting right there like, I don't know, 19. The 20,000 level, 21,000, yeah. which is a log- logical place to find Yeah, support. I mean, this, would, this is where it consolidated and broke. Right, we consolidated for basically all of May and half of June. So it can move higher from here. Otherwise, it could be the pause before the next leg down. And the beauty of using prices, we'll know, you know, above 12, you know, 20, let's call it, we'll call it 20, 21, 900, 21, 915 on Bitcoin. Above that, the next logical place to pay attention would be 28,000. But really, Below 18850. I don't know why anybody wants to be involved with Bitcoin. And I don't say that to bring hate. I'm just saying that's what price shows. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Strong dollar environment. Looks like some commodities like oil. I know you pointed that out earlier today. May have yeah, crude trying to find a bottom here at 95. We've still seen energy correct, but there's some things here short term that look like, and that goes back to the seasonality we've talked about for the past three weeks into August. You can see some positive price movements. Doesn't fix what's going on, big picture perspective. But we actually went beyond 20 minutes. We did. That's okay. Congrats. You lucky, you lucky listeners. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I know Dan's waiting for us. He um, is. And 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 we appreciate that. Dan helped us with some of the notes today. So uh Appreciate that. And I love grinding with you guys. This job's not easy and bear markets aren't easy. You guys really kill it. And I, and I appreciate it. And we thank everybody for listening and we'll do it again next week. All right. Have a great weekend, everyone. Mm-hmm.